So good afternoon, everybody. You're in the webinar for the California OER Council, and the topic for today is creating a grant proposal and planning your campus project. So for this particular session, typically what we've been doing is going through a series of slides to provide information to everybody who attends. But in this case, I suspect that many of you are already in progress to creating a grant proposal and working with people on your campus. So before we go any further, we've got three two of you who've joined us today. If you've got a mic, would you mind chiming in and letting us know where are you in this process? Kelly, do you want to start us off? How about Corinne or Dana? So Corinne, your campus is in the first steps of the proposal. <clears throat> so you've gone through the Academic Senate proposal, or are you talking about the actual uh, proposal for the entire grant application? Dana, you can also just type it into the chat box if that's easier for you. And Kelly, I see that at Hartnell College, you're in the exploration phase. Does that mean that you are uh, working on finding coordinators or working through finding disciplines and courses? Oh, good. Corinne says that the entire grant application is what you're working on, um, but that the proposal hasn't been approved by your Academic Senate yet. And Dana, your campus has convened a task force, and you're working on getting your resolution passed. OK, so you're working at the Academic Senate level. And Kelly is looking to see if there's enough interest anywhere. And Dana also starting your plan. So it looks like for the attendees today, the working on the Academic Senate proposal is one of the issues or the areas where you are. Uh, finding stakeholders and uh, identifying disciplines and courses is another area. For Kelly, you said your Senate is considering resolution itself. Has any of you explored the faculty yet themselves or reached out to any department chairs? OK, great. Both Dana and Kelly said they've been starting the process of reaching out to identify departments or faculty. And Corinne, too, has started with reaching out to deans. So have any of you taken a look at our uh, stakeholders PowerPoint that we've provided in the toolkit? Would it be helpful to go over that? It gives, provides you with specific language about how to reach out to people. OK, so I'm going to take you, I'm going to share my web page uh, desktop, and I'm going to take you guys over there. And we're going to look at that particular uh, aspect from the toolkit. It's toolkit number one about what language do you use to sell it to people. And I do understand that some faculty might be interested in content creation. That is the only area that we are, that is not specifically allowed to create a textbook for this particular grant. However, curation activities can be funded. So if faculty want to work with librarians to amass pieces from that have already been created, that definitely can be funded. But first, let's take, take care of it. It's called a value proposition uh, template. I'm going to So 
So if you see, you should be able to see our Cool for Ed website right now, step one, two, three, and four. If you click on the toolkit number one, and we go down, and let me also drop this into chat so that you guys can find it as well. So under part two, creating a grant proposal, planning your campus project, see it's modeled on different projects, but we can, uh, we can also use these to help you with your AB 798. So this was for the CFUs and their affordable learning project when they were talking with ambassadors. They really wanted to know how to highlight for deans, department chairs, faculty, librarians, IT, and service-oriented people on campus. How do you sell this kind of project to them? So value propositions are really a more of a marketing statement. And you're free to list as much as possible as you want and put them into emails if you're emailing with people. So with faculty, we do the who, what, how, why, and then the value proposition at the very end. For faculty, we can start to talk to them about from a social need or a social justice need to help students. But it's also, you see in the second under why, ensure every student has their course materials on the first day of class, which is often an issue with some students who are waiting for financial aid to come through. Now, AB 798 says that the materials just need to be free to students. So if the library already subscribes to a database or already has an e-textbook that is available, you just have to figure out how you can get that to students for free in any of the sections that are part of AB 798. If we keep going on this, some of the other whys motivate your students to read your course textbook. Some of the things that we have found in our research is that students get access to a free textbook, an OER textbook, or something licensed by the college itself and the library, but they aren't necessarily doing all of their studying from the textbook itself. They would rather look something up via Google or something that has more immediacy to it. But with these free textbooks, and if we demonstrate to students how to use them, it might motivate them to read the course textbook more so than just doing their random searching. We do have some evidence that OER textbooks have improved some student outcomes and retention. We've especially found that this is relevant for community colleges as they start to look for equity funding to continue this kind of work beyond AB 798. We haven't had a chance to do extensive um, development and research on this kind of project, but we would hope that the community colleges would be able to do this specifically with their equity charge. We have found that the use of OER textbooks uh, has seen improvement with student satisfaction. They say that they are, because it's free to them and they don't have that stress of paying $300 for a biology textbook, that they are more uh, aligned with it and that they'll use it. And in the survey itself that we provided to students in the fall project, they also indicated that they were much more satisfied with the use of this particular textbook that was an e-textbook because they could just carry it around on a tablet, a laptop, or even some of them can use it from their mobile phones. So one of the things that we've also found is that talking to department chairs is very uh, fruitful because sometimes departments have a class that everybody has to take, for instance, something in math. In, in that instance, departments often choose one textbook for all of this course, so all sections of this particular course. So when you're talking to a department chair, you might talk to them about improving student outcome and retention because it's a key course for majors or minors, or maybe it's a general education course. And the same goes when speaking to department chairs, improving student satisfaction. And this is an important one, innovating the department curriculum by refreshing existing courses. And this is something that's also coming down in 
uh, future legislation or potential legislation in the governor's office now with the Z degrees, the potential to allow faculty to refresh their ideas with new and innovative um, OER textbooks. Now, OER textbooks, the fear from a lot of faculty we found is that they're not rigorously peer reviewed, but we the OER Council has created a rigorous peer review rubric and it has peer reviewed 50 uh, courses and textbooks to go along with them. And you can also find that from toolkit number one, that listing. The California Open Library for Education or Cool for Ed. And here you can go into a course showcase, and you see that these are articulation numbers specific to uh, the CID, and they account for articulation from the community colleges to the UCs and the CSUs, and the council used that as their foundation for choosing 50 courses that would articulate across all three segments. So you can start there. You can see the general course descriptions, the faculty reviews. In most instances, we were able to get a review of all of the textbooks by one person from each of the three segments. So it might be a different, uh, slightly different point of view by a CSU faculty member versus a community college faculty member. But faculty might be more comfortable reading something from somebody from their own segments as well. So you can use these as well. So also for the dean, and I know a couple of you have already mentioned you've been talking to your deans or associate deans. This is language. The whys, again, is in over here in the, one of the later columns. Uh, and the college-wide adoption of open or low-cost course materials support the dean's goal of increasing student enrollment and college revenues. Um, and this is a lot of classes that are GE or lower division end up being impacted. There's way more students who want to get into it, or perhaps transfer students than can be accommodated in a particular class. Now, we also find that students drop classes based on the cost of the textbook. So if the cost of the textbook is down, perhaps not as many students will be dropping. And then perhaps students can also make a decision between a section that uses an open, free textbook versus one that uses a for-profit textbook. And then the dean can run an experiment to see which section is um, uh, filled quicker or it goes in, in terms of the semester or the quarter, that it's, it's filled and that it proceeds. And you can do case studies in that in your work as well. Again, improving student satisfaction and improving student outcomes and retention. So you see it's the same whys throughout, but you'll notice there are, there are a few different focuses for each audience that you would be working with. So I just want to go back over and see if you guys have any questions in the chat boxes. All right, and this again is available if you scroll down onto the toolkit number one, creating a grant proposal, planning your campus project. It's the CSU Affordable Learning Solutions Value Proposition Framework. So free to use it as much as possible. So we've covered uh, identifying and finding stakeholders, and you're working on, some of you are working on already identifying the disciplines and the courses themselves. And then from there, you can go to find faculty to participate. Now, there was an earlier query or response about content creation. And one of the things that we wanted to be able to emphasize is that even if faculty are interested in creating their own textbooks, before they do that, they might participate in this project instead by figuring out what's already out there and doing that as a professional development workshop. For instance, if faculty are already on board with using OER, or perhaps they're already using it in their class, previously, you can invite them to come and give a professional development workshop on your campus, and that could be part of your plans proposal. And I just want to take a moment to go over to professional development. 
So we have a frequently asked questions that we keep updated, and it's based a lot on what the emails we get and the queries we get, and also the questions you ask in the webinars. So we've had an update just recently. And I'm going to share my desktop with you again. So you'll see uh, we're in frequently asked questions right now, the basics of the AB798 RFP. And we've added some professional development possibilities. Scrolling down to it. We realize this is getting long now. We might add a table of contents so you can easily find things. So number 13 is, could you share an example of OER professional development or workshop resources? So you don't have to reinvent the wheel in doing these workshops and offering them. You might consider starting with workshops in fall 2016 and continuing those on through spring 2017. And all of the faculty who come to or lead the workshops in fall 2016 are dealing with some of the issues such as teaching and learning strategies. Uh, uh, we have two-day workshops. We've got an OER workshop on how to find things. We also will have video tutorials for faculty to just go and watch the tutorials on finding OER themselves. Um, OER issues include understanding Creative Commons or teacher perceptions on OER. We also do have a resource list for you available in toolkit number one. And I'll go over there. Here's a bibliography of case studies. You might consider crafting professional development workshops around those as well. And this is also in our fall pilot project. We found that what faculty wanted and other people wanted was research conducted on the use and the prevalence of OER textbooks and their efficacy in classrooms. Bibliography of case studies is available to send out as research articles to any faculty who are, are interested. But you might consider running a professional development workshop for anybody who wants to attend giving them the option to either continuing on with the grant or if they just want information right there. You can perhaps have a discussion surrounding maybe one or two of these particular articles. For instance, S2, the Tidewater Z degree and the intro model for sustaining OER adoption has been a very good case study for student retention and use of OER. So go back over to the FAQ. So there are also organizations who offer, can offer workshops for you if you would like to employ them. You would have to find out how much it costs for them in your particular university, and you can include that into the plan itself, depending how much money you wanted to apply for, $10,000 or up to $50,000. Okay, so I'm back with us over in our slides over here. Uh, I'd like to take a moment just to ask you guys, based on the information that I've provided for you and based on the questions that are in front of you about where you are in the proposal process, what is it that we can do to help you on your campuses? You can either speak up or you can put it into chat and we'll address it. Okay, so maybe I'll just show you guys a couple of the new nifty things that we've come up with in terms of helping you move forward, especially in drafting your campus plan. The first thing that I'd like to show you, we are about to release tool, toolkit number two. I'm going to take you over to there. It is in draft form right now, but April 1st we'll be releasing it. And these are this is more help with creating professional development. Again, this is not public yet. We will notify everybody and let them know when this is released. So you see right here, it says what is what this toolkit does, crafting elements of your, of your basic plan itself, development workshops, demonstrating faculty use of OER, tutorials on finding OER materials, 
tutorials on student use of OER textbooks, information on ADA compliance, and then how to peer review OER materials, identifying best practices, implementation and use of OER materials, and creating a sustainable OER adoption plan. So you'll see we have some samples of other professional development workshops in addition to the frequently asked questions list. But we also have professional development workshop topics on what is OER. And we have starter kits and slide sets. And there's even a five module course that we have access to that you may just be able to borrow and use on your own. And that's the kind of information that you can sketch out in your campus plan, but don't have to be specific about having the presentation ready to go or the faculty development ready to go right then. You might need to talk to other people about that. Building a community, understanding faculty and campus needs, uh, and we also have survey instruments available for you right now. We used faculty and student surveys in our full pilot project. We've create, turned those into Word documents. You may use those as much as possible for faculty who are going to be in the process of using OER materials. So we've given you your progress report and from our survey tools to use towards the progress report and also your assessment and measurement. And you're free to use those. Again, we will release this on April 1st and we'll send a blast to let everybody know. We've also got some discipline-specific discipline OER workshops um, that are going to be available. And one of the things that we've been hearing about is the need for learning management systems integration and who to speak to on your local campus. You see we're in the process of developing this as well. We also ask people to tell us what they need in terms of using OER materials because a lot of faculty also talk about having those ancillary materials, either the ability to annotate or to pull parts of the OER textbook out so they can use it in a slideshow for their students, or actually just letting students know how to use an OER textbook. The fact that students need to turn off all internet and all notifications so that they're not disturbed. Students often use digital media and technology very well, but they don't often control it very well when it requires deep attention. So by April 1st, we will also have a video tutorial that you could just show to students about what it is to use OER materials and how to use them best. Digital annotation was another thing that was requested. We've also had questions about printing services for textbooks because that is part of uh, what people have asked about. If you can't charge that much with the bookstore, then how is it the students are going to print this out? So we've got seven different facilities that are online that we recommend that students that either they can work with campus bookstores or some of them work directly with students for low cost printing of any particular OER textbook. So then we also have sustainability beyond the OER funding from AB 798 and accessibility, talking about ADA compliance. Jump back over. I see there's a couple of questions in here. Let's address those. So Corinne says, can you go over budget unallowables and deadlines? Can you say more about this, Corinne? So I think what Corinne was asking is, what's not allowed in this request for funding for AB 798? And there is something in the frequently asked questions about what is explicitly not allowed. I'm scrolling through. So the only thing that's very explicit that is not allowed are just two things. There cannot be direct compensation to faculty for participating in the project in terms of just adopting OER materials. The second thing is that the funding does not support the uh, creation of new OER materials. 
It does, however, support the curation of OER materials that have already been created. And you can see the development of MOOCs or online courses that include non-matriculated students, the creation of new OER materials, the purchase of new equipment, or past curricular conversions to OER materials. So the other question was about a timeline. So we're back on the Cool for Ed website. And you see in step one, it says review timeline. So the, the hard and fast deadline for submission of these proposals is June 30th, 2016. And it's going to be an online submission form, which we'll have available, I believe, as of May 1st or June 1st. And we'll be available to go through the technical aspects of it when it, at that particular time. In terms of the timeline for the, the proposal itself, everything, let's go back over to the FAQ. And we've just clarified some of the timelines. You can see to the actual RFP itself. So the description of your campus activities include an estimated timeline for implementation of your plan from October 2016 through at least June 2017. So your plan can include the next academic year through June 2018 if it's feasible for your campus to do that. Corinne, does that answer your question? Okay, thank you. Now let's go to Dana's question. You said you're not sure it's directly related or even easy to address campus messaging issue related to the way that funding amounts are determined versus how they're dispersed. So the only reason we say that $1,000 per section um, is allowed, that's just for accounting purposes. That doesn't mean that you have to spend $1,000 on that particular section or that particular faculty member. Dana, does that answer your question? So Dana, you, uh, you know, Dana's question involves, just in case you can't see it, that involves explaining this to faculty. So this is what you mean by the messaging of it, correct? So just because a faculty member comes on board, remember they can't get direct compensation for just adopting it, but you can invite faculty members to come to professional development, and that's the way that they would get any sort of direct compensation to them. However, you can invite any faculty member to professional development, but it doesn't guarantee they don't have to commit to doing the OER sections themselves. So when you talk to faculty about it, you want to pose it in terms of not necessarily how much money they will get, but it's up to your campus to figure out strategies for helping them with the professional development of the OER, of adopting OER textbooks. So I'm wondering if you need to mention they will get money at all when you first contact them? Or is your campus a culture uh, established where they ask how much money they're getting? Yes, I see you've, written, <laughs> you've been avoiding it, Dana. <laughs> So Dana, could you advertise it then to faculty as a series of professional development workshops? And then in that way, you could, you, you set it as the campus coordinator. You then set how much faculty receive for attending or leading a campus uh, professional development workshop. OK, that's great. It sounds like you're on the right track. Have you been getting resistance from faculty?
well, Dana says that they're considering holding a summer OER institute. That would be really fabulous. And if the council can help in any way possible uh, with the development of that, then we are certainly on board. Ah, the campus coordinator position. So we've heard from quite a few people that it's hard to guarantee the campus coordinator position for more than a semester at a time. And what we have been telling people is that you can have more than one person Maybe somebody will take it over for a semester, and then another person will take it over for the following semester, as long as you can account for some continuity between the campus coordinators. Does that answer both of your questions? So the campus coordinator is the person who's going to be reporting to us to the council to 8798 at the end. So if the campus coordinator is somebody who can be sustained beyond 8798, that would be the best of all possible worlds. But we know the reality of this. If you want to share the duties between, among, between or among people, faculty, librarians, or other coordinators, that would also be feasible as well. But you'd have to articulate that in your campus plan. Kelly, did I answer your question about is it ex expected to be sustained? OK, good. I want to show you guys something that might be incredibly helpful that we just got today. We released it today, and I'm going to, I haven't had a chance to go all the way through it, but I think it might help you in creating your plan. We have a template for a plan, and it's quite simply a series of spreadsheets that you just have to fill in and submit. So let's go take a look at that. It just went live like an hour ago. So I'm going to drop the link. And let me know if that link works. We haven't even had a chance to test it. So you, you guys are our beta testers. So you see that the, this is the sample campus project plan. You just really literally fill in everything, your campus name, the potential students enroll, the project objectives. So we've might, tried to make this as simple as possible. We've also got the metrics you'll track to compare with your objectives. And you can take those metrics from our own student surveys and faculty surveys if you would like uh, and just adopt them for yourself. Or if there's something specific that your campus is interested in, in assessing for the use in these particular sections. Uh, the campus readiness, is, it says list the aspects. Let's, let's boost this to full screen. List the existing aspects of your campus culture, organization, or resources and support service that will help you in this adoption of the, of the low cost or no cost materials. And these are things that you can start to identify now, working with the library, working with your bookstores, working with your IT department, working with perhaps even an instructional designer. If you have a teaching center that also wants to get involved, you would start to list them here. And then we are also interested in those campus challenges. What do you foresee might be an issue? And uh, when it's not necessarily a requirement of the proposal, but it will help us as we go through all of them to assess how you're going to overcome these kinds of things and if your proposal is feasible. Now, down below, you'll see here I'm pointing to, you've got the whole uh, gamut from, these are all sections that are part of the proposal, a part of the RFP itself. So with the project team, you've got coordinators. There's several spots. There's three spots. You can add more if you need to. Working group team members, project partners, organizations and responsibilities. That, that's where you might put the bookstore as well. The project governance structure, executive sponsors, meaning who in the administration will be part of this, what major decisions from these sponsors are needed for your project, 
other shared governance individuals or groups. Perhaps the Academic Senate wants to be definitely a part of the decision making as it moves along. Let us know here. Communications and outreach. So we've incorporated our value propositions in, into these. You can go back and take a look at the value propositions that we've already given you in toolkit number one and do a cut and paste and see if some of these will map onto your potential stakeholders already at your campus. I'm just going to take a minute to check over. Okay, just wanted to make sure you guys didn't have any questions for me. So training, this is professional development plans. Now again, use everything that we've already provided for you, potential professional development uh, topics and slideshows and videos and even if you went to another organization, definitely use those. You don't need to start from scratch doing any of this and you start looking at all the information and putting it together. So help and support services is also very important because you, have to, you might have to get IT on board and again somebody specific in the library, there might be an open access librarian or an OER librarian already on your campus and that might be, for the CSUs, that might be the affordable learning uh, so solutions coordinator, you can use them as well. I'm just checking. Feel free to throw something into the chat box if you have a question. I'm checking over there and Teresa is also watching. So discovery to distribution. How, what's the plan for discovering OER materials or how will they be curated? If there's not something that's specific, you might go to your library and work with a librarian for the faculty member. That could even be a professional development workshop. How do you curate using the existing resources in your library? And then also the distribution through digital means or print course materials. The print course materials is a portion of the RFP that is required. Okay. And again, measure of success, go back and use our survey instrument tools and about measuring success in the course if you so desire. We also have an assessment of our e-portfolios and you are welcome to take a look at that. That's coming on April 1st as well in our white paper that demonstrates all the research we did in the fall pilot project and beyond in the last two years. We provide you with that survey instrument tool in the white paper as well as the raw uh, survey tool itself for both faculty and students. So this one's very important, the, the technology, facilities, policies, and resources. So this means that you've talked to the appropriate people on campus who can help you either distribute information or they're working with you with your faculty on the OER textbooks themselves or the library itself. And again, I'm just go this is the first time I'm seeing this and going through it, so uh, I'm, I'm taking a look at it now as well. And then finally, this is the projected cost savings and progress report template. We make it very easy for you to just fill in. Hi, Dana. Uh, Teresa is correct. You didn't miss it on the website. It went live on Cool for Ed uh, 10 minutes before we started our webinar. So if we go back over to Cool for Ed, it's down at the very bottom in step three, campus plan template. Again, this is so very brand new, it's less than an hour old. You are free to access it and download it and use it right now. I believe Teresa just put the link for Google Docs into the chat bar. Definitely use that immediately. Okay. So I've done the big reveal and the ta-da of the two things, the toolkit number two, as well as the template for the campus plan. Campus plan is available now. Toolkit number two and the white paper with all the research will be available April 1st. And I also want to just very quickly, I'm going to go back over to my desktop. 
And I want to show you, just in case, or maybe you want to show your other faculty, if you want something very quick for them to take a look at, all of the other webinars are already up and public on our cool on our uh, California OER Council uh, YouTube channel. Sorry, I'll get it right in just a second, and I'm going to drop that into chat. So maybe you want to tell a new faculty member about what is OER. Instead of you doing it in a lengthy email, you might just drop a link into getting started with OER with Dr. Larry Hanley. Dr. Takashida and Dr. Guthrie did a great job of creating a slideshow and a webinar on mobilizing faculty. How do you speak to them? And Dr. Guthrie also did an, a, another webinar on getting started with OER that's slightly different than Dr. Hanley's OER version. And then we also have an over, overview of AB 798 from the community college perspective. And then also from a, Dr. Leslie Kennedy, who's with the CSU. And then I also ran one, and I'm also with the CSU very early uh, in March, early in this process. So we will also be uploading more videos. All of our tutorials that we're creating for both students and faculty will be available on our YouTube channel as well. So this is what's coming next in toolkit number two. And I just want to get this up and available so that it's actually on the webinar video and you can access it later. Again, it's available April 1st, and we really look forward to showing this to everybody so that you have it available to you, not just to use in professional development, but to send to faculty right now to entice them to come on board. To receive notifications about toolkit number two and the white paper release, it says register here, but the question is, where is here? So let me share with you again my desktop. And I'm going to go back over to the Cool for Ed master page. And you'll see it says, for questions, contact us. Please do use that as much as you need, ask questions. It also underneath says register to receive updates and notifications about future webinars, office hours, or draft feedback. I'm just going to click on that. It's a very easy Google form. Fill out your information. And then Teresa sends out an update every Monday to let you know what's been going on, what, what's available in terms of links, what are the new YouTube videos that are available, and what webinars are coming up that particular week that you might be interested in. And I just want you to be aware of the remaining webinars. Maybe if you're the campus coordinator, maybe you want to send a faculty member over to take a webinar. And they can stay for as long as they like or as little as they like. So you see on March 30th, we again have mobilizing faculty participation and leveraging existing resources. And then we have a basic on April 1st of OER textbooks and digital tools by, by Dr. Guthrie again. If you have a faculty member who's on the fence, you might just send them over and ask them to come and participate and ask questions. You'll see that we have through April, we get more specific with our webinars. Uh, student learning habits, ADA compliance, and measuring student learning will be, be very specific towards building your plan. And then we have faculty development examples and models coming up, so in, that's toolkit number two. And then our research findings by Dr. Bonilla will talk about what we found in the white paper. And we'll have that up and available for you guys as of April 1st as well. And if you just go through, you'll see more and more. We have faculty case studies and user stories. We have actual 10-minute interviews with faculty who have used OER materials. And that will be also be forthcoming with April 1st the toolkit number two release. So if you need a human side to it rather than just email, we're going to have that for you on April 1st. And then in May, we start our open office hours where we're just there for an hour and send us a draft or just stop by and ask questions. We're here to help you guys be successful on your proposals. We want to give away all the money. So for those of you who are on the fence and still exploring it, know that you're not doing this alone and that you have ample help and that you can send us drafts and ask us uh, as many questions as you, as you would like. 
So Kelly asks, how much awareness is in the administration? So Kelly, do you mean at the local college level, the individual institutions, or do you mean overall? Okay, at the local level, I do know that you were president for the Academic Senate. David Morse did sit something, something out to all of the top level, the presidents at all of your campuses. So they are aware of it or should have been made aware of it. And this information was sent out in late February, I believe. Does that answer your question? Great. And Kelly, I think your question also might involve, if you go to your, your administrators, are they going to know what you're talking about? Now, the answer to that question is they should. Um, they've gotten a, an email letter specifically from David Morse. So they may or may not have paid attention to it. Uh, in which case, if you would like to contact your community college representatives on the OER Council, we can put them in contact with you and perhaps they can facilitate a conversation with your administrator or just give you a copy of that letter. How does that sound? Okay. Would you mind dropping your email address into the chat box? Or you can, I emailed everybody today, you can just send me an email back on that, uh, the council's email address and, and we'll get you in contact and make that. Okay. Teresa, would you mind making a note of that for us? Okay, so we are wrapping up uh, a little bit here. We've got about maybe 10 more minutes. Is there anything else that we haven't covered for anybody? Okay, I'm dropping in here the link, that's the link to register for updates, just in case you haven't already registered for them. I'm also dropping in here, this is the link to the remaining web webinars. And finally, that is the email address to ask for help. In addition, we are also happy to take a look at your Academic Senate proposal before it passes. Okay, so I think if there's no more questions, we're going to conclude for today. Thank you everybody for coming in and asking great questions.